Okay, good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could everybody make sure that their, any mobile devices they have are switched off, um, or at least in silent mode so it doesn't interfere with the work of the committee? Um, item one is taking um, business in private. Are we agreed to take item three in private? Thank you very much. Um, item two on the agenda sees us move on to evidence on the Joint Audit Scotland and Accounts Commission report on self-directed support. And I welcome this morning Fraser McKinley, Director of Performance, Audit and Best Value, um, Anthony Clark, Assistant Director, Lorraine Gillis, Senior Manager, and Zoe Maguire, Auditor, all from Audit Scotland. Um, could I invite an opening statement from Fraser McKinley? Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Members. Um, so, as you say, Convener, uh, we are delighted to bring to you today uh, the report on the progress of self-directed support. As you say, it's a Joint Auditor General and Accounts Commission report. Um, a wee bit of background, first of all. Self-directed support, often referred to as SDS, aims to improve the lives of people with social care needs by giving them much more choice and control over their social care support. And that requires significant changes to the way social care has been provided in the past. The 10-year self-directed support strategy was introduced jointly by the Scottish Government and COSLA in 2010, and the Self-Directed Support Act came into force in April 2014. And at that time, Kivina, you'll remember that uh, we reported, uh, we, we published a report on um, readiness uh, uh, of the implementation of the Act at that time, uh, and we found that Council still had a lot of work to do to make the cultural and practical changes needed to successfully implement SDS. This more recent report looks more closely at people's experiences of SDS and what is helping and what is hindering progress. As you'll see in the report, Convener, we found many examples of positive progress and the audit team heard some real success stories from people for whom SDS was working well. But it's also clear that authorities have not yet made the transformation required to fully implement the SDS strategy. And we also heard about people not getting the choice and control envisaged in the strategy and some who were really struggling with the process. Social work staff are very positive about the principles of SDS and of the whole idea of personalisation around people's social care, but a significant minority of them lack the understanding and confidence uh, that they need to implement uh, self-directed support successfully, and we found that staff need to be more empowered to make decisions with people about their individual support. Where staff are well trained and supported, and they have permission and encouragement from senior managers, that's when they are more able to be bold and innovative with people about their social care. Of course, you'll be aware that authorities are experiencing significant pressures from increasing demand and limited budgets. And within this context, changes to the types of services available to people have been slow, and authorities' approaches to commissioning can restrict how much choice and control people have. In particular, what's known as SDS Option 2 looks quite different from one area to another. There are some tensions for service providers between offering more flexible services and making extra demands on their staff, particularly when there are already challenges in recruiting and retaining social care staff in many places in the country. And we found, uh, finally, convener, that SDS implementation stalled somewhat during the integration of health and social care services. We find that managers' attention was inevitably diverted towards the arrangements for setting up integrated joint boards uh, and running and scrutinising those new integration authorities. So in conclusion, convener, the report makes a number of recommendations for local authorities, for the Scottish Government, for COSLA and other partners involved in implementing SDS, and those are shown in the report on pages 6 and 7. And as ever, convener, we will be keeping a close eye on the continued progress of self-directed support and uh, with, in discussion with the committee, may well consider revisiting it in the future. So with that, Convener, uh, myself and the team are very happy to take any questions the committee has. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr McKinley. Um, could I record apologies from Monica Lennon and from Alex Neal, um, who aren't able to be with us this morning, and then turn to the first question from Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to look a little bit about around budgets here, because that's, to me, the key to all of this. But money, unfortunately, is uh, is central. And I'm looking at uh, paragraph 62, bullet point three. And you're saying here that fewer people qualify for social care support because of the tightening of eligibility cr criteria at councils. And you're saying that the number of people, older people in care homes has gone down 
from 30.4 to 33.3 per thousand, and the proportion of people receiving home care has also decreased from 60.8 to 49 per thousand. That, that's quite dramatic drops. And yet, a couple of bullet points before, you're talking about an 8.6 per cent increase in real terms of the cost of servicing a much decreased population that qualify. Why is that? Um, I'll ask the team to come in, Mr Beattie, but in, in a nutshell, it's, it's the demographic change we are seeing uh, with significant increases in particularly older people um, means that they are, uh, we're needing to spend more on social care, not only to keep up, but actually just to keep the system, to keep the system running. Um, it's worth saying, I guess, that the question of eligibility criteria has been a, is a long-standing issue in social care. It predates self-directed support. So, of course, that's, that's always been part of the, the equation that authorities have to balance in, uh, in providing care. Um, but there's no doubt that the combination of, for local authorities overall, reducing budgets and an increasingly demanding demographic changes, both in terms of the number of older people and the care needs of those older people, means that that's where the, that's where the squeeze is coming. So uh, are you saying so that the complexity of care has increased dramatically and more than compensated for the reduction in the overall numbers? Anthony, do you want to take that? We covered this uh, issue a little bit in the report we published last year on social work in Scotland. At that time, we reported that uh, you probably know that most councils have a common framework for assessing needs with, with four levels of eligibility criteria. So there's critical risk, which is a high priority. There's substantial risk, which is also a high priority. You drop down to moderate risk, and then you have low risk. Over the last few years, most councils are now only um, setting and providing services for people who are assessed at being critical and substantial risk. So the point we've, you've highlighted, I think, is that the threshold for receiving services is now higher than it used to be, and therefore the services people are receiving tend to be more complex and therefore higher cost. And is that purely because of demographics? It's a, it's a combination of de demographics and also um, choices councils have made in terms of the targeting of their resources. Um, I just find it difficult when there's been what's a fairly substantial reduction in the number of people in the system which surprised me. Uh, and couple that with an 8.6% increase in real terms of the spending. D does that equate? Does it, does, it, does it make sense? The other factor that is probably worth bearing in mind is the cost pressures in terms of pay increases for staff and also general inflation across social work services as well. That doesn't just apply uniquely to social work services, it applies to other services councils provide. That's also a factor in, in, this, in this whole discussion. But further on in your report about staffing, you're talking about uh, difficulties in getting staff, uh, lack of staff available, sh staff shortages. So it's not as if it's not as if uh, are staff costs rising at that level when you can't get staff anyway. I mean, I'd, I think I need to do a bit more analysis to properly answer that question, um, Mr. Beattie. It's something we can go away and look at. Um, I, mean, I, I think in terms of the workforce, the, the, there is definitely difficulties in recruiting and retaining staff in social care um, and that's even with the uh, changes that have been introduced more recently about paying the living wage um, and, and that, so that's an increase in cost pressure but even then um, there is still in some places very low uh, unemployment these days um, and so it, it is proving difficult to get people into these kinds of jobs. What we hear when we're out there of course is that um, the added pressure to that now and the added risk is the uh, decision to leave the EU, um, relatively high proportions of uh, non-UK uh, EU citizens working in social care. So, so that is a real pressure. Workforce is a real pressure for um, for authorities across the land. I'm, I'm still just trying to get this get the logic here. 8.6 percent real terms increase. Staff numbers potentially have not increased dramatically. There may have been a bit of an increase because of the living wage. The numbers of people in the system that are, that are receiving care have gone down fairly dramatically, actually, in terms of home care and significantly in terms of people in, uh, in care homes. I'm, I'm just trying to figure, get, get the logic here. They, they seem to be, they don't seem to make sense. So, um, um, 
we can forward this on to you, um, Mr Beatty. In the previous report we wrote on, wrote on Social Work in Scotland, we had an exhibit that set out the changes of spending across the different services that social work departments provide, older people, children and young families, and adult services as well. So what that demonstrated was there's a, a relatively stable position in terms of um, expenditure on older people's services, an increase in spending on children and family services, and also an increase in spending on services for the 18 to 64 year olds, which is the, um, so that, that if we forward this on to you, it might help you to understand the, how, how the figures have all stacked up. Okay, that, that, could, that could be useful because uh, on the face of it, 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 it doesn't really stack up what, what we're seeing here. The funding from the the funding for for care does that come through the IGB? Um, so so the so increasingly yes, but it's worth bearing in mind that the funding for the IGB comes both from the health board and the council. So so at the moment the process is that the uh, health board and the council in a local area agree how much funding goes to the integrated joint board. It's then the integrated joint board's job to commission the services required for the social care services that are within scope of that integrated authority and it is worth remembering that different IGBs have different services in scope. Is it working well? Um, it's early days I think um, and as we say in the report Mr Beatty there's no doubt that over the last couple of years as integrated joint boards are being set up and established, that has taken a lot of time and energy and focus, particularly from managers getting the arrangements around IGBs, uh, as we reported in our report last year, uh, is taking a lot of time and effort. And inevitably, that's diverted attention away from things like this. So is it working well? I think it's too early to say. I think they are all up and running. Um, we've just finished the, finished the first year of audit of the uh, integration authorities. We're proposing to do a second report on uh, how the health and social care integration is going next year and that will be about this time next year we're bringing that through uh, and obviously we'll, we'll be bringing that to the committee uh, and at that point we really should be able to see what the impact is on services and potentially on the outcomes for people at the moment all the evidence has been around arrangements and getting themselves set up and governance and those kinds of things we are now needing to get to a stage of seeing integrated joint boards make the difference to services and to people's outcomes um, and at the moment it's a bit early to it's a bit early to see Okay. Bill Berman. Um, thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, sometimes I like to ask detailed questions, sometimes a, a more of an overview. I think this morning it's more of an overview. In your introduction, um, Fraser McKinley, you gave a very balanced um, description of, of the situation. But my sort of reading of the report and the key messages from you are that the programme is not going as quickly or as smoothly as might have been hoped for or expected. And I just wondered who is responsible for that and who in the chain of command is holding them to account? Um, so I'll kick off on that and then maybe ask uh, the team, maybe ask Lorraine to come in there, Mr Bowman. So you're absolutely right in that it's, it, it's a mixed picture, I think is what we say. Genuinely, we've, we've seen some great examples of where SDS is working well for people and uh, in some case study areas, places that are really committed to it and you can see that culture change beginning now to come through. We also say that um, everybody, government, councils and everyone else involved in it underestimated the scale of the challenge to this. So yes, I think you would say that when the strategy was written back in 2010, we probably would have expected to be further on uh, as we sit here in 2017, seven years into a 10-year strategy. I think that's absolutely fair. Um, and one of the concerns, I guess, is that um, delivery is still far too inconsistent. So you know, depending on where you live, you will get a very different experience. Um, uh, and we, we heard that a lot in, in all the research and all the, the audit work that we did. Um, I'll briefly touch on the accountability question and then maybe briefly hand over to Lorraine. Um, it's, it's always, um, I always feel like I'm in danger of fudging the question a little bit when I say it's not one single person. Um, but it is a genuinely systemic uh, change, this one. And uh, I think if I were to characterise it in two ways, the government um, the Scottish Government sets the strategy, set the policy with COSLA. Um, and actually, in our last report that we published uh, three years ago, said, I think quite rightly, that the government had taken a very inclusive approach to developing that strategy, and that was well received. And I think that you can see the benefit of that now in that the vast majority of people you speak to who are involved in social care think this is a good idea. So we've not really heard anyone at this point saying we shouldn't have bothered. 
the challenge then, and, and actually since we did the report three years ago, there's a lot of guidance and a lot of support out there now um, to help people deliver it. And there's no doubt then that if you take it to the next level down, which is councils, health boards, and increasingly now integration authorities, that the delivery is very patchy. And there's lots of different reasons for that. And we tried to get into some of those um, in the report. So, so it, in terms of who's accountable for it, it really depends where you are. Um, the national picture, obviously, the government ultimately accountable for that. But in local terms, um, depending on how the services are delivered, it's going to be a combination of either the council or the integration authority. Lorraine, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I think, I think that's a very good description. I think having been involved in some of the field work on the audit, I think I was struck with the differences. And we, as a team, sort of did have lots of discussions about, you know, is, is, is this glass half full or glass half empty? And it was very difficult for us, I think, to come to you know, any real conclusion because, you know, there are some, as Fraser said, some really good examples, and we were quite excited and enthused about some of that, you know, where creativity was clearly happening. You know, and, and people were having really good outcomes because of the way that they had been empowered to engage with decisions about their own sport. Uh, on the other side of that, we were, you know, we we did see lots of examples where people weren't being empowered, and that you know the, the decisions weren't being made with them; they were being made for them, and that's clearly against the kind of landscape that we're moving into. Um, I, I I think that what has been slightly disappointing is that we have an, a landscape just now around empowerment and that people are being encouraged to be you know involved in planning their own support more and that that it, it doesn't feel to me that that has gone hand in hand but I think you know we've certainly called some of that out in the report and I think there is scope for that landscape to take this forward but um, I don't think I would have anything else to to add unless Zoe you want to um so from what you're saying there's good work being done wouldn't want to take away from that other areas where support or guidance is needed does, does it come back to the sort of concept of I mean, project management and is anybody project managing the whole thing so, so there, is, there is a team there's a policy team in government and there's a, an outfit called SDS Scotland and there's a website and so that kind of infrastructure nationally is in, is in not bad shape I think I think though the thing that we saw that makes the one of the biggest differences locally is is leadership and how managers engage in this whole process. So we, we use East Ayrshire as an example of where we saw very clearly the most senior people in the social care um, uh, function not only being kind of accepting of it, but actively promoting the principles of STS as a, as a way we now do business. Um, it's funny enough, I was, I was reminding myself of the official report from three years ago when I was talking to the, the committee then, um, and and I was, I was saying at that time that I, I had to get it in my head that it's, it's not a case of you either take self-directed support or you don't. Self-directed support is a new way of delivering social care services with people. And I think that's the shift that people are, are having to make. We see some authorities that are, that are further down that road and doing it well. There are others that are less far down that road. And a big part of that is to do with management and leadership. Okay, thank you. So I think I take from that that there is still some leadership needed overall. Okay, thank you. Okay, Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to pick up that leadership ball, if I may. Um, you say at paragraph 9, page 9 of your report, that the Scottish Government continues to have a crucial leadership role to play in the successful implementation of this transformational strategy. So, first off, does this mean, uh, in your view, that the Scottish Government has not been providing the required level of leadership? Uh, and can you give more detail, if so? Um, certainly, Mr Kerr. So, no, I don't think that is what we mean in this context. I think, as I said to response, in response to the question earlier, I think the way in which the Government have gone about this whole exercise has been very inclusive. Uh, and, I, and as I also said, I, we recognise, and I think everyone recognises, that everyone involved in it underestimated the scale of the challenge. Um, so from that point of view, um, I think uh, I think they've done the job that you would expect them to do. Um, there is now, and I'll ask uh, Anthony maybe to come in here, there is now a question, and certainly we heard a question about funding. Uh, now, to be fair, the government have been very clear all along about what the funding is for and how long it's going to be. We're now coming to the end of that transition funding. Um, and so there is now a question as we look ahead uh, as to what exactly the role of the Scottish Government is going to be in, uh, in, in generating some of the uh, 
generating the environment, the climate, if you like, that I've just been talking to Mr Bowman about. Uh, and I think that's what we're trying to get at here, that um, even though we are seven years into a 10-year strategy, this is absolutely not the time for the government to take a step back and say, well, over to you, um, local authorities. There is still a need for that national leadership to create an environment in which this is this is now the way we do things, so embedding it. Anthony, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, earlier on, Fraser mentioned the finding when we did the first report, which was the Scottish Government working in partnership with COSLA and local authorities. Whilst we were doing this work, we found that that story continues. It, it was very much a, a sense of Scottish Government and local authorities trying to work to, uh, together to understand what needs to happen to make this policy real for people out there. And uh, there is the, the joint COSLA, Scottish Government, Self-Directed Support Implementation Plan 2016-20, 18 that was recently published that sets out the actions that they plan to do over the next couple of years to address in many ways the issues we found in our report. So the things they're focusing on are things to do with improving commissioning, you know, creating a culture where staff have the confidence to be more innovative and also trying to make sure that, that they work together to streamline and make it easier for people to negotiate what we found in our audit was often quite a complicated process for people who are trying to access self-directed support. It is a tricky balance though because um, I, I think this isn't a, 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 a change that can be micromanaged or that can be imposed on local authorities. And local authorities, IJBs and health boards, need to be able to respond to local circumstances. Um, that's both a, an opportunity and a challenge in itself because clearly you want a consistent and well-developed approach across the country. So the national leadership role is partly about setting the direction. It's also about working with all the other partners to really understand how effectively this is being delivered on the ground. And we've made a recommendation in the report about strengthening and improving the quality of data about the extent to which people really are receiving choice and this policy is improving the services and outcomes. Can I uh, press you on that? Because uh, I read the 2014 report as well and I was struck by uh, the... It, it, it appears to me that uh, this is a, a, an initiative that's been brought in uh, it's a potentially very good initiative, uh, but it rather seems as though when you talk about micromanaging, the impression I got from the previous report and to an extent from this one is that the policy has been brought in and almost said, there you go, this is what you have to achieve, but we're not necessarily going to guide you particularly closely as to how to achieve it, uh, uh, which surprised me. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think it would be a slightly unfair assessment to say that it's just been handed over to you, really. Um, Fraser's already mentioned the fact there are a whole range of groups in place that are joint groups between the Scottish Government, COSLA, providers and experts that are trying to understand what's happening at local level, prepare guidance in a collaborative way. So there is a sense of joint working, I think, to provide clarity insofar as one can about what should be happening at local level. Should guidance have been prepared beforehand? Guidance was prepared at the beginning. Um, I think what I'm talking about here is people learning the lessons of how implementation is going and then refining guidance so that things can be improved moving forward. Um, it it kind of touches on the point about the, the finding of people having slightly underestimated the scale of the challenge. Um, people have learned, I think, a little bit as they've gone along about what they need to do to make this work more effectively. It was a voyage to an extent into the unknown, really. You're trying to d develop and implement a, a very different way of working, a very different way of engaging with service users. I think it was always quite difficult to predict quite how that should best be done. Yes, and it, you, you've uh, alluded to the, the challenges being underestimated uh, a few times, and uh, I appreciate that. Uh, but th this committee hears quite a lot about challenges being underestimated, policies being brought in, and then uh, we look at it some years later and say, oh dear. Uh, and and that, that rather concerns me. And uh, we've looked at the, the 70 million roughly being spent uh, on implementation so far. So there's two questions begged by that. First of all, do you have any insight about what modelling was done uh, at the outset to say this is 70 million is what we'll need for to implement this project? Uh, was there business planning done? to say this is, this is the amount it should be. And then coming forward, is there any assessment, any learning to be taken from an assessment of what outcomes have been achieved, what KPIs have actually been hit, uh, and where best value has been achieved for that 70 million? I'll ask the team to come in in a second on the specifics of whether we looked at the modelling point, Mr Kitt, it's a very good question. Um, I think what I would say in general terms is that um, we, 
we are frustrated, as I'm sure you are, that again, this is a report where we're saying we don't know what the baseline is and we don't have a benchmark. Um, and that was a recommendation we made, we made three years ago. Some progress has been made, but we're still in a position where we don't have good enough data really to get under the skin of the the scope and the reach of SDS and particular things like option two, which is obviously the newest bit, the newest bit of the landscape. So that is frustrating, uh, and as you say, that's a common theme. The question of of how much things cost um, is related to that in that. Um, we we do think it's difficult to find exactly what has been achieved for that money. Uh, I think government would say, well, that money was very specifically to provide guidance, to provide support, to help with the transition. So you may not necessarily expect a direct line to improved outcomes because it's about getting the thing set up. Um, I'm also conscious from, from our work and I think from the submissions you've received that there is a debate between local government and local government and Scottish government about whether that money was enough. Um, that's a common debate we hear on on lots of new policy initiatives, whether whether it's early early years in uh, learning, whether it's uh, SDS or anything else, and there is always a judgment in there. I think your point is well made, though, about um, and we will take this away and have a think about what we might be able to do around that whole question of the rigor around the um, uh, financial modelling and the business case that that you know comes through the financial memorandums and the legislative process, uh, but then is obviously turns into actual real money when it comes to implementing things. I think your point is well made there. Team, do we have anything on the specifics of the of, of how they came up with the original figure? Well, because we were looking at progress to date, we didn't really look back to say what was done at the start of implementing the, the legislation. Um, there was obviously a financial memorandum that was prepared and there was a degree of scrutiny on that. And you'll be aware from the correspondence you've received from COSLA that there still appear to be some ongoing concerns about the overall level of funding to support implementation. Hey, uh, yeah, I, I would like to come back to that just in a couple of seconds. But uh, one quick question begged is, uh, understanding is that the funding will be turned off, if I can put it that way, in 2018. What happens then? And why was that not planned for at the outset? So, so to be fair, the, the, the turning off, to use that phrase, was planned for. That was always the plan. So that's um, that's... That's not really coming as a surprise to anyone. It was very specifically transition funding and the way that has been managed is as, it, as it was set out by the government, to be fair. Um, but as I said earlier, and as we say in the report, um, there is now discussion underway about what, what, if any, additional funding from the centre, if you like, from government uh, is required um, to, to get um, the strategy up to, uh, to, to a better place of completion. And, that, and those discussions, we understand, are underway at the moment. I'll just add one point. I think you might know from the submission from the Scottish Government, the Scottish Government has already committed to ongoing funding for ad advocacy support and information services running through to 2021. Uh, and talking of submissions, just finally, uh, in this section, the uh, given COSLA's concerns regarding the Scottish budget process, um, do you think that the Scottish Government needs to take a longer term and more flexible approach to local authority funding uh, to, t to implement this part of the, national, the transformational strategy? Um, so as you know, Mr Kerr, we are, we are big advocates and fans of as long term as you can, um, and I would include that in the local government and the NHS. It's, it's, report, it's something we've said in relation to the NHS, it's something we've said, uh, the Accounts Commission has said in relation to funding for local government. Um, absolutely, I think the, the, the more clarity and certainty into the future that councils can have about their funding overall, and therefore the bit of that that's for social care and how that applies through to SDS um, would be a good thing. So yes, we would we would encourage government to do that as we do encourage councils to take a longer term view as uh, where they can. It's not directly related to self-directed support, it's related to another piece of work we're doing which we'll be bringing to the committee next year which is on early learning and childcare. Um, as part of that work we're looking at the planning for expansion of, of early learning and childcare to meet the Scottish Government's commitments of uh, by the end of this, this current parliament of expanding uh, the access to publicly funded child care, early learning and childcare. Um, that's an area where we understand the Scottish Government has already committed to local authorities that will give them a three year funding envelope to allow them to plan with a bit more certainty and confidence. So to an extent that is happening. Thank you. Ali Kofi. Thanks very much. Convener, um, hey, thank you Fraser for the, the comments you made earlier about East Ayrshire and the, the role that they are playing in this process. I do know that they are heavily engaged in this and I do believe too that it is the way they do business, the way they see it. That was a comment that you, you made earlier. So that's 
very encouraging, and it's encouraging also to hear about so many success stories right across this this programme. But as usual with the audit committee, there are always opportunities for us to explore how we can improve the situation that we have. And I'd like to turn to the one of our favourite subjects of data gathering and evaluation. And you've you've mentioned it several times about the kind of inconsistent approach to data collection that's that you you've seen during your your uh, inquiry. Um, could you give us a little more insight as to how the, the different authorities are performing here, particularly in relation to the, the options that people have. I'm particularly keen to find out about option two and the take-up of people are having an option two and what the picture looks like across the landscape in Scotland. So, so I'll kick off on that, Mr Coffin, and maybe ask Zoe to, to come in with some of the detail. So as we say on, on page 14 and onwards in the report, um, again, more reliable is, is required. And I guess I just want to make the point that we... We don't just say this just because we're auditors, because we like data. Do you know, we, we like we, we say this because we think it's important. We say this because we think it helps decisions. We say this because it helps people understand what their choices are. And I think for me, there are there are two levels. One is a kind of basic one about um, how how are people accessing services? What options are they um, are they taking up? But then even within that, as we say in the report, if you take option two as the example of being the more the most innovative, the newest option available, um, does look very different depending on where you are. Now, to some extent, you might expect that. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But the point is we don't really know whether it's planned variation or whether it just happens to be different. And I think that's the bit that's um, that would be enormously helpful um, to better understand. Uh, Zoe can say a little bit about what we have done in the report. In the, the next couple of pages, 16, 17, we've we've pulled on the data that we that is available that begins to paint a bit of a picture around SDS, but but it is slightly impressionistic because we don't have the solid data on the on the choices. Zoe, do you want to add anything yeah. to that? Um, yeah, I, I suppose in terms of the specifics of the, the local authority areas we went to, I don't think we saw anyone that had kind of cracked it and got the the data gathering thing together. It, it is quite complex, and it and it comes down to in a lot of areas just con computer systems kind of understanding it and also for um for social work staff to kind of understand um the options the options that they're presenting and that they have actually given each option um explained with the service user each option that's available to them so i think um yeah so i think we didn't really see anyone that's cracked it. there's some people that are there's some authorities that are starting to understand it and to get the computer systems in place um but i think I think that's where it starts. With if, if obviously the local authorities can't gather the information well enough, it's really hard to aggregate up to the to the, the national level. Which is why, when you see it under we, we we say about how we need better information gathering. That's which um, the, from the national statistics, which I think the Scottish government recognises. It's data under development at the moment. There's a lot of issues I think um, uh, with with those numbers, and I wouldn't feel kind of comfortable um, saying this is exactly how many people are getting SDS because we just don't know at the moment. So is there, even within the authority, did you ask, it, was there any assessment of what the uptake kind of should look like per authority? I mean, the, the authorities done that, or are they? How, I mean, how does how do the people who are, who are exercising option two exercise? Do they come forward and say, "I want to make that positive choice," or is, is there an encouragement to people to to think about that option as being the one that most cl closely reflects their, their needs? So how it should work is what you just said at the end there. Um, so, so how it should work in terms of the legislation and the guidance is that through through meaningful dialogue and conversation with service users and their carers and their families, you come up with the best option for that person. Um, and so, I mean, I think one of the challenges is it is possible for that whole process to go really well and to be done absolutely in the spirit of SDS and for people not to know that they've just had option two because they're not necessarily sitting down with somebody saying, you've got these four options and here's option two for you. Actually, if it's a genuine conversation about their needs and what's going to um, have the best chance of improving their outcomes, you might not really know that you've gone down route two. It's important for the council to know that, I would suggest, and for, and for the providers to know which it is. And that's why uh, Zoe's point about the systems is, is really important. But it's not necessarily the case that the people on the receiving end of this will, will necessarily know which, which option which option they're taking, and actually that that would be a good thing. Um, the issue, as you said, though, Mr. Coffey, is that that's not what we see everywhere all of the time. Um, the Perth and Conross model is interesting, for example, where they've delegated um, certain amounts of money to certain levels of people that they can just commit uh, without checking, and they keep track of that. 
uh, and we find that's helped in terms of that sense of empowerment for the frontline workers who they know who know that they can commit up to two hundred pounds or four hundred pounds whatever it is um on on services um uh, to to you know have the best chance of improving outcomes for that person that's not the model we see in other places um where it's a bit a bit more tightly controlled and people are a bit uncomfortable particularly about more innovative or slightly more creative solutions um, so so I think exactly as you say that as well as the kind of statistical thing about how many people are getting what option there is also then that difference of experience that people are having across the country which will vary enormously depending on where you are and the colleagues have mentioned budgets at the end of the day that will be a crucial factor do you think we've got the balance right in, in supporting the choices that people wish to make and I mean, in terms of the, the options that they wish to exercise on their own behalf and the support service we need to put in place to, to deliver it. Have we got the balance right there, do you think? Uh, no, I, I don't actually have... I, I, I think that it's as best as it can be. I think that it's... I wouldn't have a, a strong view either way on it. That's not a very good answer. Mm. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> As part of the audit, we did quite a lot of work with social workers, social work managers and support staff to explore what was helping and hindering implementation of self-directed support. And I think we anticipated that budgets would be a big story, really. But it, it wasn't the story. It wasn't universally the story. So in some places, social workers and other staff were saying it was clearly constraint on the choices and their ability to implement STS. But it wasn't universally the case. And we found variability both across authorities and even within authorities. So it, it's clearly part of the story, but it, it wasn't the, big, the whole story in terms of what's helping or hindering SGS being implemented properly. Mm. And, and looking beyond uh, the report again, convener, um, where would we go next with something like this? We're, we're seven years into the 10 year programme. You've made some fairly familiar recommendations that we've all seen and read over a number of years. So if, if you're back again next year with us, what would you expect to see by way of improvement in terms of data gathering and evaluation and so on and so forth? So in, um, so we would expect to see the data that Zoe described as currently under development having moved on and being uh, much more reliable. Um, we would expect to see a continuation and indeed an, an upping of the, the pace around um, sharing good practice examples and ensuring that the learning in the system is happening. Um, and I think really importantly, um, particularly now that the governance discussion around integrated joint boards has kind of happened, we really need to be see seeing those organisations making a difference on the ground over the next two to three years. I think the next three year period for IGBs is hugely important. Um, I think you can um, forgive people a bit for getting these things up and running and getting the governance arrangement sound and understanding how all the money works. Of course, that's really important. Um, but there's no doubt that our evidence on the ground is that that's got in the way of things like SDS. Um, now, actually, in an ideal world, those two things would have been considered together. We would have been looking at setting up IGBs alongside an approach to social care that the SDS sets out, but that hasn't really happened. We've kind of concentrated on getting these things set up, and now we're coming back to, you know, upping the pace on SDS again. So I, I would certainly hope that in the next two to three years, for the, the remainder of the strategy, you really do begin to see that that consistency of experience, the consistency of delivery supported by better systems and data being the norm really across the country over the next three years is, is where we need to get to, I think. And, and to help that process to succeed, is, is there an independent evaluation planned or underway by the, the department to, to assess and monitor this? Yeah, when, so when, would we, when can we expect to see that? So, so, so the government, um, as you'll see from the response, I think have a number of things in, in, in train that, that will help them uh, evaluate overall where they are as they get towards the end of the 10-year strategy. So um, so absolutely, we would expect to see uh, a clearer assessment of uh, of uh, the extent to which the strategy has achieved its the aims that were set out 10 years ago. And lastly, on that, I would, I would hope that we could see as members, constituency members, regional members of the parliament, how our respective local authorities are, are doing and performing, not just a national framework, national picture, but I would like to be able to see per authority how we're actually doing with this, this whole programme. So thank you very much for your responses. Thank you, Convener. Okay. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Uh, just before I talk about the workforce issues, 
Uh, I would like to just, uh, a number of times you mentioned things being underestimated, uh, and at paragraph 87 of your report you talk about what was underestimated. But have, have the Scottish Government or any of the partners actually explained to you why they underestimated the scale of change? Um, so, n not really, I suppose, is the, is the answer to that. Um, I, and I guess that's because it, was, it, it wasn't just government, it was everyone, I think. Um, while they had, a lot of planning had gone in uh, to the strategy, a lot of planning had gone into the implementation of it, I think the bit that was very difficult to know at that point was just the sheer scale of the cultural change that was required to make this thing work. Um, and um, I think, as well as that, obviously a lot has happened. The world has moved on um, uh, since uh, since 2010. And as you say, we list some of the things in here that we've that we've subsequently identified as some of the things that that they didn't anticipate that that weren't that weren't completed. So, um, so I, I, I'm not sure it was a. Our sense is it wasn't a, an, an absence of thought on their part, on anyone's part. It just genuinely was. The scale of this cultural change here was was something that people had underestimated. We don't need to analyse that though. In order to get adequate learning uh, going forward for yep. when something like this happens again, yep. uh, don't we need to understand the why so, as well as the what? So I think that's what we've tried to do in this in these sections, Mr. Ken. I think we've um, you know with the benefit of hindsight looked at. Um, what was planned, what has actually happened, what was done, and we've identified on Paris 87 and 88 um, the kinds of things that, that with hindsight should have happened, and as you say, in future, we, we would look to learn these lessons for sure. Thank you. Uh, so I want to look at um, the workforce briefly. Uh, Zoe Maguire in an answer earlier on talked about the options being explained to users. Uh, and I see at paragraph 53, of your report, you have uh, a quote uh, from somebody who says, in my view, social workers have become gatekeepers for resources. They know the decisions being made at head office are wrong and in some cases counter to the legislation, but they have no power to do anything. So is it conceivable in your view that staff may identify several beneficial outcomes, but only those achievable with the existing resources being provided uh, are the ones that are actually presented as options? Yes, we had certainly had those sorts of discussions with frontline social workers as we were doing our case study work or our field work. Um, it all seems to come down to leadership and permission. So if a social worker has a permission to be able to think out of the box and be innovative and creative, then you can see, you can follow that through to the, to the outcome for the service user. Where permission isn't clear or where there's some sort of um, different understanding of what the purpose of self-directed support is, then you, we, can cert we did certainly see some differences in the outcomes that were being achieved by the service user. T to put it crudely, if there is a, a, a buy-in that this is about people being able to have that discussion and you know having those you know really tricky conversations about what's the best thing for them, and if that buy-in is there, then by and large, the social workers are able to deliver on that. If there's some sort of sense from you know, from frontline staff that actually this is, you know, this is quite tricky, this could be difficult to do, that's not on the list of things, it's a wee bit strange, then those conversations are more difficult for them. Fraser referenced the uh, Perth and Kinross model, and we certainly found that that was making the difference. You know, where there was an implicit permission for social workers to have a threshold, then they were able to be more creative and innovative in the, the discussions that they were having with people. So I, I think yes, we, we definitely would see and some the, of that. And the point you make, Mr. Kerr, is absolutely right. And and I guess is is something you see across, to varying degrees, all public services. So so I guess doctors have similar choices to make about uh, a balance between the best possible care that's available and the cost uh, associated with that. It's exactly the same with this. And there's always that kind of balance to be struck. I think I think when that I think when it works well, as Lorraine says, is when that's a conversation between the service provider, the social worker and the service user uh, in an explicit way that says, well, yeah, that might be the best thing that we can possibly have, but actually that's that's going to cost too much, so what else can we do? I think where it's more problematic is where the social worker, and I think this is what the quote is, is kind of getting a sense of, when the social worker feels very constrained to even have the conversation in the first place. So the message that you hear as a service user is we just can't afford it. 
there's no budget, which, which is a very different kind of conversation to one which is actually trying to explore what the what the solutions might be. So again, it's that the qualitative nature, which is why we've done uh, for us a lot of qualitative audit work in this report, speaking to service users and social workers, because I think that's where you really begin to get under the skin of it. Understand. And just to add to Fraser's point, one of the important messages that came through from the qualitative work with service users and carers was differences in terms of the transparency of the process. So some, some people were quite clearly saying that they weren't entirely sure how much money was available, both in actual terms or nominal terms, and, and therefore they felt that they weren't necessarily being able to express a full choice or, or participate properly in, in that discussion about the right services for, for either themselves or the person that they're caring for. Thank you. Uh, staying with the the actual staff on the ground, as it were, <clears throat> I, in one of your key messages, uh, number four, you say, at the same time, there are already challenges in recruiting and retaining social care staff uh, across the country owing to low wages, antisocial hours and difficult working conditions. Uh, it begs two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, this is in the context Anthony Clark mentioned earlier about increasing of early learning and childcare. Uh, and so how, how will the commitments under SDS be resourced in a context where the demands on the staff are increasing significantly, aren't they? It's very challenging and, and there's, no, there's no indication um, beyond the discussion we had earlier about the, the transition support and then the support for advocacy there's no indication that there's going to be specifically more resource for this. Um, so that's why it is about a shifting of a way of working more than it is um, investing in, in more. But there's no doubt that um, the point you make about um, care staff across the board is, is hugely challenging. Um, the, we're, we're, we're awaiting, keenly awaiting, uh, I think towards the end of this year, um, the joint Scottish Government and COSLA uh, workforce strategy, workforce plan around health and care. Uh, as you know, we did a report, uh, uh, the Auditor General did a report earlier this year on, on the NHS workforce um, uh, and the, uh, we're expecting, uh, as I say, government and COSLA to produce uh, a health and care workforce strategy by the end of this year. And we'll be looking very closely at that because I think that's where we would expect to see the response to the, to the challenge you've just described, Mr Kerr, because it is significant for sure. It's not, and it's not, as you say, just in terms of um, a quantum of work or a volume of work increasing, although that is a thing, it's also the nature of that work, um, particularly around SDS, being quite different and asking quite different things of frontline social workers and care workers. That's exactly right. And the uh, the second question begged, of course, is the, the issues you identified, low wages, antisocial hours and difficult working conditions, are presumably not going to change or be changed by the developments later in the year. So. Do you see anything changing? Uh, and if not, do you see the challenge being solvable? I mean, I think that that what we've described there is, 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 is how we've tried to capture the challenge and I guess to some extent the perception of, of care work at the moment. But I suppose what, we're, what we begin to get into is if you're genuinely thinking about changing how care is provided and delivered. So for example, if, if in 10 years time we get to a place where home care is provided not on the basis of 10 minute slots, if we manage to find a different and better way of doing that, then actually the profession of being a home care worker might be more attractive to people. So, so the two things kind of go hand in hand. And I think that's the kind of thing we would expect to see in a workforce strategy at the end of the year. It's not saying how do we deal just with the, crisis, the, 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 the problem today. It's actually what does the service need to look like in five or ten years' time? And what, therefore, do we need to start doing in terms of recruitment, training, promotion, attraction, all of that stuff? to make it a more attractive career option for people. So it's those kinds of things that we'll be expecting to come through. The other dimension to this is, is not just the, the role that social workers and health staff and the third sector play, it's also the role that communities play as well. And I think when we were doing our field work, um, we saw some quite innovative and some quite thoughtful uh, practice around local authorities, IJBs, thinking about what the community empowerment tax might mean for the role of communities in supporting people themselves. So that's just an added dimension to this, which may, of course, reduce the pressure on the resources needed from the public sector. I, I, I was just going to sort of make that point. I think we saw some very innovative work, particularly up in um, Western Isles. Another thing to say is that we've seen you know, some examples of local authorities who know this is an issue, know it's going to be a worsening issue, and trying to do some innovative work. So for example, we saw Stornoway 
Council, uh, Western Isles Council doing some work with Skills Development Scotland to try and attract young people into caring. Now, it, that's a difficult thing to do. It's, there's a challenge, but you know, there's, it kind of feels like there are discussions starting to be had, given the resources and given the demographics that you're working with. Forgive the daft laddie question. Uh, there are obviously some people doing some really good things. How is that uh, best practice being captured and shared across the, uh, across the piece? There, we've already described lots and lots of support agencies and organisations, particularly in the third sector, that are supporting a lot of this innovative and creative thinking. And there are lots of examples of practice exchanges and people trying to you know, come up with new ideas and, 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 and you know, discuss their particular issues and the challenges that they have. So this is a live issue. I think it's not, you know, people are very aware that there, there are issues around that and there are various attempts to have those discussions, to share practice, to, to look at um, where they can do things a little bit differently. We, we did hear and we were hoping to hear some more, I don't know, sort of cluster. Zoe, do you want to describe what we're... Yeah. So I'm going to pan over to Zoe. <laughs> um, I, suppose, um, I suppose kind of picking up on that a little bit is, is the idea of self-directed support if someone goes in um, and has their outcomes assessed, and uh, for example, um, uh, we met um, a young man who um, had quite severe learning disabilities. So, if, so an, on a sort of traditional model, he might have a certain, certain uh, going to in a care home or something. But under SDS, he's kind of given. If he goes under option one, then he can get a direct payment, and then he actually um, his personal assistant was um, a friend that he made at school. So it was a more peer to peer support. Um, type of care rather than a more traditional type of care so which worked really well for him he met his outcomes he was able to um he's able to actively participate in society he went to school he then went to college um, and can actually really um engage in, in in society so i think um so i think so may so i can you can kind of see how some of the issues around the more traditional care work it becomes it becomes more um Come, becomes a better option when, when you're talking about care workers in a slightly different way and thinking about care workers in a different way. Thank you. Bill Derman. Thank you, convener. Um, to come back to the sort of big picture again, not the, the individual ones, um, and looking at the, uh, sort of the Scottish Government responses to your points, which I think you presumably have, um, do you feel that you've been given the the sort of answers you would hope to hear. I mean, I, I read the last one, which says, ensure that the requirement to effectively implement self-directed support is reflected in policy guidance, and so on. You know, the recommendation will be examined and progressed. And they fill up, finish up saying something like, this will add new imp impetus to the implementation of self-directed support. I mean, you know, there are things going well, but there are things not happening. You know, you, you, I think to somebody else, you were asked what you might see in a year's time, and then you were speaking about a 10-year time scale. It doesn't sound like you know, they're taking this on board and going to do something about it. Um, so two things in there. So, I, so as ever, um, I, I would like the responses to be more specific, uh, and I think that one in particular could have been more specific, um, and so uh, that, that I would accept. I don't, I don't think that necessarily means, though, that they're not... That the government aren't taking it seriously and doing quite a lot of work on this, so I don't think I don't think I would uh, I would go that far. Um, on on that one in particular, I think we, we think that's really important because if if SDS is genuinely about a different way of operating, then it needs to be built into everything else. And at the moment, it still feels a little bit siloed. It still feels a little bit like there's an SDS policy over here, and then there's a childcare policy over here, and then there's the Community Impairment Act over here. All of those things need to be coming together. Um, and so that's why we made the recommendation. And of course, we will um, look very carefully at the, the reform of adult social care programme as it as it progresses. So um, so I guess we are, uh, we are content with the response um, from government. Would have liked in some places for it to be more sp specific in terms of the action that they are now taking. Um, but I guess to give assurance to the committee, we will continue to um, keep close to this whole issue as we, as we progress towards the end of the strategy. I mean, do you see something behind the scenes that suggests that, you know, oh goodness, this report's telling us we, it's a wake-up call, we need to do something? Um, I, I'm not sure it's been a wake-up call because I think with, with some justification, I think government would say that they've, they've been awake to this for a while. Do you know, it's not, uh, so, so a lot of the stuff that I think Anthony mentioned, a lot of the stuff that we've raised in our report and uh, recommended 
is contained in their strategy action plan for the next two years, 2016 to 18. Um, I, I could speculate that that might have had something to do with the fact that we were doing this audit and they knew it was coming and behind the scenes they, they knew what we were likely to say. Um, and, and if that's the case, then I'm delighted with that um, because it because it moves the thing on. So so I guess it's, it's one of those things where um, it's, it's a... Um, it's a process that's that has been ongoing and I think what we're saying now is and I think government agree with this is that there is a step change required in the pace and coverage of implementation I think that's the key thing there's been a lot of good work done but we're now at a place where it needs to be happening more consistently in more places wait but they just need to get out of bed maybe <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you Holy coffee thanks again convener I wonder if I could um, just ask you for your your thoughts on the issue of choice, ultimate choice. Um, a service user perhaps decides they need this or that and an assessment disagrees with that. And not on the basis of cost, so as William Kerr was uh, leading us earlier, but say there's no issue about cost. Ultimately, who makes the decision? Because I see your, your example on page 27 there where and you refer to him as George and he decided he didn't want particular here on a Saturday so we could save the money up for a carpet. <laughs> so did George get his carpet, I suppose? But where, is the, where ultimately is the choice? If there's a professional judgment about something that a service user wishes that the professional team disagree with, where do we sit? It's, it's the kind of core question at the heart of SDS, Mr Coffey, I think. So the starting point is um, the, the safety and well-being of, of the service user. And I guess at that level, the to use that terrible word, the professionals will say that's just not a good idea. Um, and we do say in, in, in the report that there are some cases where that element of choice isn't really available to people, even if they want to do something different. You know, the needs assessment may be saying, no, actually, that isn't, that's really not a good idea. Again, that's where Anthony's point about transparency and discussion is important, because it's important that people understand why that's the case, rather than just told you're not getting something. So beyond that, then, you do get, and this is why in Exhibit 6 we, we highlighted some of these challenging scenarios in relation to risk, because as well as the money there is for, for authorities in particular, and the carpet's a good example of this, some big reputational risks around some of this stuff, because you can imagine some of the local news headlines if, if public money is being spent on somebody getting a new carpet. Now, um, that is where the leadership question is important, and that's where... Uh, frontline social workers operating in a clear policy environment is important. We mentioned somewhere else in the report a wee case study about the Highland Council trying to, I think came, coming from a good place, trying to provide a bit of clarity about what was okay and what wasn't, but in actual fact it was received not, it was received not positively by people because it felt like things were being prejudged and, and decisions were being made even before we'd had the conversation. So it is very, very difficult and, and it is going to be a judgement and that's why the meaningful dialogue between all the parties is so important because then you've got a better chance of getting to an answer that everyone's comfortable with rather than a more transactional thing which is somebody come along saying I want this big long list and somebody else saying well you can't have ten of those things you can only have two that that's not going to work well, I, think, I think I would say that this was something that we considered very much when we were conducting the audit. It, it was very much how we approached the audit and the, and the methodology that we used because we were very clear that if we took a, 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 a more process-based approach to this, we would be able to tell some parts of some stories. But I think it was very important to us that we were able to talk to people who are using self debt to support and their families and their carers to try and understand some of that nuance and some of that tricky stuff. And I think there was a challenge for us, you know, to try and present that i think in a way that was you know that was able to show some of that um some of those tricky conversations and how that could be perceived because there are some difficult decisions being made by frontline social workers who you know who are being trained and supported to be able to use their professional judgment you know in a way that you know is, is about an outcome for that the person that they're working with and there are clearly some challenges up and down the kind of line of command and, and, and then accountability and then supporting those decisions being made. And we talked a lot to social workers who loved self-directed support because they felt it was what social work was about. You know, they were actually able to help people get what they wanted, but there were some tensions around that, around budgets and what would people think and, you know, all of that. So 
I, I think that that was something that we came across throughout the whole piece of work that we did, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we've been able to show through the report the complexity of the decisions that are being made with people. I mean, do you think? Oh, sorry, Mr. Clark. Lorraine makes a very important point about the link between outcomes and choice as well. I mean, this isn't. This is a very different way of thinking about the kind of support that people should should receive under the SDS model. Previously, as you know, people would simply be almost put in boxes for you need this service or that service. This is about trying to think about people's needs and identify how you might develop and deliver different services or combinations of services in quite different ways. And uh, in the report, we, we highlight the assessment work that the Care Inspectorate has done on the, how social workers feel about assessing outcomes and planning for outcomes. And there's quite a striking trajectory of um, the, the extent to which the support plans that social workers are agreeing with, with users and carers do focus on outcomes. So it's gone from half of the, the plans having outcomes at the, at the centre in 2014 to three quarters of the plans having outcomes at the centre in 2016-2017. So that's quite a big, quite a big change. So that's part of the, the, the tension here, I think, in terms of social workers beginning to understand, well, will the conversation, will the service deliver outcomes, as well as the cost dimension to, to, to the discussion as well. And, and this is about judgments, isn't it? You know, people will have different judgments about what's right, and both in terms of the services and, and also the use of public funds, which adds to the complications of, of, of this process for everybody. Is, is there still a big issue in there, though, for local authorities or social workers, OTs, who, who may fear litigation, perhaps, if they, they recommend something that is for a person that is ignored? Um, are there any cases where the, the service user does proceed with their choice against the recommendations of the social worker? Or I don't think that was a thing we came that, across. In, right. in the, I don't think the, so the concerns that, that social workers had wasn't to do with being sued or, being, or, or litigating in any way, Mr Coffey. It, it was more to do with, you know, what happens if this doesn't work? Can I spend the money? How's it going to look? What's my manager going to say? Am I, do I have permission to do this kind of thing? So it was those kinds of issues more than a, more than a specific thing. And, and you know, just to be clear, um, best, the concept of best value remains incredibly important in this whole discussion. So, so absolutely, the decisions that are taken, however innovative and how creative, need to stand up. They need to stand up in terms of both the outcomes and in terms of best value and value for money. Um, in an ideal world, and we have some of those in here, you can do all of those things. You can improve outcomes, and it can it can be less costly, and therefore value for money, best value is delivered. Um, but but absolutely, there is a need for authorities, managers in particular, to have an eye to issues of best value and reputational risk. Of course, it is. Okay. Thank you. Can I take you back to um, the point Colin Beatty raised with you because I just think it's it's helpful to capture some understanding of this. Um, I think it was Mr Clark helpfully outlined the framework by which social work allocate resources as critical, substantial, moderate and low, and basically the top two are the ones that get funded. Um, is that then a reflection, if there's greater spend but fewer people, that actually that money is going towards complexity and crisis rather than prevention? Is that a fair comment? Um, so I, th I think that's a reasonable conclusion you can reach, convener. Yeah, I mean, I think that over the years, as Anthony says, that bar has raised um, so that the, the bulk of that increasing resources being spent on longer term and more complex cases, um, and therefore that money is kind of by definition not being spent on prevention. My only, the reason I hesitated, convener, was that that doesn't necessarily therefore mean that there isn't any preventative work happening. It's just that it's maybe not being spent out of that particular budget because, of course, there can be lots of, you know, work in the community. There can be work in housing. There can be all sorts of other ways in which prevention uh, can be done that, that can help prevent people getting into those top two categories in the first place. So there's not a there's not a direct line necessarily, but but for sure your analysis is sound, which is the you know the bulk of that money is now being spent on the top two the top two categories. Because I remember debates maybe less than a decade ago where we talked about shifting the spend to prevention because that, you know, avoided people getting into the more complex, more costly stage. So I'm assuming that if that's happening, you know, across the board and you accept that analysis, then it's happening within SDS as well and this is simply funding complexity rather than anything else. Um, no, 
I don't no. think there's necessarily. I don't think that necessarily follows. Um, I, I think, as I said earlier, the, the, the question of eligibility criteria and decisions being made locally has always been there in terms of social care. So, in a sense, that hasn't really changed, and that would be the case regardless. If anything, I think you would probably argue that self-directed support as an approach should actually ease the pressure to that. It should actually help because it should allow um, uh, more engagement with the people who need services at the at the, the lower two the two areas. So so it should be part of the solution. Um, but there's no doubt that constrained resources across the piece inevitably for people makes it makes it harder to change significantly how they're going about their work. I mean, I would agree. I would have thought that it would lead, lead to earlier intervention and therefore more prevention. But but we really don't have the data that that takes us there. So key from you and you know my one of my colleagues pursued this is is actually getting the data set right that we're able to truly measure the effectiveness of this. Um, what what discussions have you had with the Scottish government? Do do you, and COSLA do you sense that they will? get to the right place? Because you recommended this in 2014 and I don't think they paid much attention to you then. So we are always hopeful, convener. Um, and uh, we do now, to be fair, have a, a data set that is, while under development, at least it's a data set that wasn't there uh, a few years ago. So our sense is that they will continue to develop that. Um, we have the responses now from this report and of course whatever the committee decides to do with it will add weight to that. But couldn't agree more that that, that is a really important issue not in its own right and for its own sake, but in terms of ensuring that this policy is is, is well delivered and, and implemented across the land. Okay. Um, let me shift you, because others have explored uh, budget issues with you, and, and you know, it is typical amongst my constituents that they say, oh, there's no money, um, and that's why we can't get the package that, that we think we need. Um, however, it, it, the scale of change is something that, that everybody's raised with you. Um, I remember direct payments introduced in the legislation, I think it was 96. Um, I think SDS is built on direct payments. You have in your papers, I think exhibit three it is, that shows by local authority the uptake um, for 15, 16. How does that differ? Is, is there substantially more uptake now we have self-directed support or is this broadly in keeping with the trend that there was previously? I'll see if the team can help with that. Uh, yeah, I can. Exhibit um, two. Uh, to, to be honest, oh, honest, I think the, the issue around the kind of the number of direct payments, I, there has been an increase in the uptake of direct payments, but I think we have to be a bit cautious about how we read some of this data. So I think, um, so uh, across the board, so from the kind of more traditional direct payments data, I think it's around 5% of people are now taking direct payments. So that's of all people that receive social care services. Now, within self-directed support, of those who have self-directed support of, of kind of assessed, this is bearing in mind the, the, the data, which isn't brilliant around self-directed support. So all those people that have been assessed of having a choice and control, 11% of people have kind of gone under option one. So um, so some of that, that the, the number of that 5% are are receiving um, SDS, some aren't. And so that some, some of that is just, it's quite difficult to unpick. Um, and I think, and I suppose my caution again against looking at some of these numbers is, well, what does that actually mean in terms of, is that a good thing or a bad thing that is increasing direct payments? It could be, we kind of explained a little bit in the report about this, it could be that it's because, um, it could be a good thing because that's the best way for that person to achieve their outcomes, or it could be choosing direct payments because there are no other services that they could have. So that's that's the, the path I've been put down. So it's really quite hard to unpick. It's quite complex. Sorry, can be very briefly. In, in Exhibit 2, just the page before, the green line tries to demonstrate what's happened to direct payments since 2010 up to 2016. There's a very gradual increase there. I think two things is there's a gradual increase it, it still strikes me instinctively as quite low, given how long they've been uh, available. And I think, as Zoe's saying, the caution then is that it's, it's also then difficult to attribute any increase in direct payments to SDS or not. It's, it, we just don't have good enough data to tell. You'd think that an increase in kind of um, direct payments would be a consequence of enhanced choice for people. But, you know, as you say, that we, we can't tell at this stage. Um, I've got a couple more questions, but I'll let Colin BC in just now. Sorry to be obsessive about budgets, but uh, I think there's maybe some quite important behind this. In your briefing paper, you said in the th uh, 
in key message two, bullet point three, authorities are experiencing significant pressures from increasing demand and limited budgets. At the same time, paragraph 88, you're talking about a smaller workforce. And again, coming back to paragraph 62, as I said before, you're indicating a substantial decrease in the number of people taking up the service. At the same time, the budget's gone up by 8.6% in real terms between 2011-12 and 2015-16. The people who are taking up this service, do we have a breakdown at all of what services they're using? Because there's obviously been something significant happening there, changing, that's impacting over and above what seems to me should be a reducing cost, not an increasing cost. So, so I'm not sure if we have a breakdown specifically of the services, but, but it does come down to, as the convener said a second ago, the, the complexity of the care requirements of people that are now in the care system. This would be, I think, in a nutshell. Um, people are living longer, they have more... Um, uh, and more complex needs uh, and and health and care needs and that I think is is how is why we're seeing the pattern you've just described. To see the and the analysis that brings that through and shows the changes happening, because obviously planning for the future, you know, we we need to understand what's happening behind this because on the face of it, the indications are it shouldn't be. Indeed, I mean, when we, Anthony might have the number there, but when we did the social work report last year, I forget the number now, but we 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 did a bit of analysis that that assessed or estimated how much more would need to be spent on social work services in Scotland, all things being equal. So just trying to follow the the demographic trend that we've just been talking about, um, we reckoned that um, there was a need for Anthony. They would, the, the potential cost increase would be £667 million pounds, um, by 2019-20, unless services change. And this is for also a, a reducing number of people, actually. Yeah. The, I'm, I'm cautious about the That's reducing number of people because um, part of the story is, is the increased use of externalisation of services as well. So not all social work and social care services are provided by local authorities or by IAGBs. There's a very quite significant use of the third sector and the private sector as well. So when you were talking about social work staff, I think you were probably talking about social work staff that are employed by local authorities and IJBs. There's a significant proportion of staff that are employed in the third sector and the private sector as well. Would that affect the actual absolute number of people who are receiving home care and so on? No, but it, but it, it would affect the point you're making about the spend versus the number of staff that are providing social work services. So the spend would increase because you're, would you're be the still same. contracting out to third parties? Sorry, I didn't make my point very clearly. Um, you, you were drawing a parallel between changes in social work spending and changes in the social work workforce. Mm. Um, I, I think you were probably citing a figure in our report that talks about the social work workforce that's uh, public, public, publicly employed staff. There's a significant portion of staff that work in the private and third sector. That's the point I was trying to make. Mm. So if we're looking at the cost dynamic, that needs to be factored in. One needs to look at the overall spend in social work services in the public, private and third sector, and also the staffing levels in the public, private and third sector as well. But we can we can come back to you on that if you'd find that helpful. And I think just finally on this convener for me, it, the, the, the interesting thing of course to bear in mind is that we, we see this trend in, in lots of the work that we do. So the NHS overview report that the Auditor General produces every year will also, also recognise the cost of that increasing demographic. And I think the reason that we are keen to encourage government to make sure that all these things are joined up is that these tend to be the same people in actual fact. So the people that are receiving this kind of care are also likely to be the people who are um, potentially in and out of hospital. So so ensuring that the kind of that to use that terrible phrase, the person centred approach is absolutely the right thing to do. And I think what we're trying to encourage government is to get the right data and processes and systems in place to ensure that on the ground that that's actually happening. Return to just a couple of final questions. Um, I'm very conscious that the way social work operates is is through commissioning. Um, you have collective services. So take the example of the day centre, where maybe 40 people might attend at different points during during the day or indeed the week. Um, if one, two, three people decide to pursue a choice that is different to that, they're then withdrawing from that service. How has commissioning changed? 
to factor that in? And are there concerns expressed by some, particularly in local authorities, about the sustainability of these collective services? So, so I'll ask the, the team to come in on the specifics of commissioning convener, but the short answer to your last question is yes, there are some concerns about that. And one of the things that um, councils recognise as a potential risk of this is that if there are more individualised and personalised packages uh, and people are choosing different things, you need to also think then about the impact on on other services, uh, and that's something that, that we heard and that's something we reflected in the report. Team, do you want to say something about the commissioning end of that? This was a topic we covered in some detail in the Social Work in Scotland report, where we highlighted that the need for social work departments, which was what we were talking about at that time rather than IJBs, to think differently about strategic commissioning in the context of health and social integration and self-directed support. Um, we cited some good examples of um, social work departments working with the third sector, working with service users to try and work out how services need to change over time. But we also highlighted a number of examples where um, providers felt a little bit excluded from those decision-making processes. And it was pretty clear from our work at that time and previous work that the care inspector has done that there's still scope for social work departments and IJBs to get better at really mapping out the change in demographic needs and trying to identify scenarios and models of how services might change. It is a risk, I think, because there's a degree of uncertainty and the need for better data in that area. Did you find any evidence from your previous report that that had been taken on board? Um, the report was only published last year. We haven't really followed it up yet. Um, it is something we'll be looking at when we do the piece of work next year on health and social care integration that Fraser mentioned earlier, because we'll be looking at locality planning by AJBs. So that'll be an important part of that story. OK. Um, sorry, no, Mr okay. McKinnon. Sorry, can okay. I Finally, from me, um, the committee is engaged in perhaps doing some post-legislative scrutiny, and this has been one area and one piece of legislation that's been suggested to us. I'm keen to kind of try and tease out from you do you think it's been a problem with the legislation? Perhaps it's too permissive? Um, do you think it actually it's a problem with implementation? And in this area in particular, in social work services, there tends to be a postcode lottery, whether it's differences in charging, differences in assessment, um, and that becomes very confusing for you know, people trying to access services. Um, is the guidance that the Scottish Government issues, is it statutory or, again, is the flexibility for local authorities to interpret in their own way. So I'm looking for just a general feel from you. So on, on specifics of the last one, the, 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 there is statutory guidance that was produced um, at the time in the legislation, so that so that is there. And, and But inevitably, it, it's quite broad because um, because the whole point of this exercise is, is to give people the flexibility and freedom to design services around individual needs. Now, um, that that doesn't help answer your question about is it the legislation or is it implementation? Um, I think what so so my sense of it, having been involved in now two of these since uh, since the policy was introduced and since legislation was introduced, is it's a it's a question of of implementation, because we haven't we really haven't heard anyone at any point saying either the policy framework's a problem or the legislation's a problem or the guidance is a problem. In fact, everyone speaks very positively about all of those things. So um, on that basis, everyone that's involved in it seems to be comfortable with all of that. The question then is, well, what are the things that are getting in the way of it happening? And we've tried to tease out some of those things in this, in this report, convener. Um, it, it seems to me that um, the, the question, th there's always a bit of a balance between it when, when something is a postcode lottery and when something is actual genuine localization. I think the thing for me is that um, you, councils and individual social work departments or IGBs need to be able to explain why a thing is as it is. Otherwise, I think they do open themselves up to accusations of it of it just being a bit random. And I think that's where we're still at. I think what this report says is that for no obviously good reason, the way in which these things are delivered, and both to be fair, both within local authority areas actually and between local authority areas, is still too patchy. It's still too different. Um, and that's why I think uh, I'm not at all surprised that you've had a lot of interest in this because it's, it's something that touches a lot of people's lives in very important ways. And of course, people talk to each other. So people will know that somebody they know either in the same area or in the next door area have had a very different experience. And they're thinking, well, why, why is it different for me? Um, on your commissioning point, just an example of that, we talk about the use of framework agreements as, as one way in which some, some authorities are operating. Um, and we have an exhibit that says there's lots of good things about that, but the danger of a framework agreement is that you can kind of, 
it can be perceived as saying you can there's lots of choice as long as it's off this list. Um, so again, we, we, we come back to those questions of, of management and leadership and culture, which are the things that at the end of the day are going to make the difference. Um, but but they need to make they need to start making the difference in some places quite quickly. Okay. Um, one final point, and I might have missed this, so my apologies. Um, is there an appeals mechanism? How many have accessed it? Um, because that usually is an indicator of whether the process is actually working effectively or not. I mean, clearly there'll be a complaints process within local authorities. I'm not sure if there's a formal statutory appeals process, to be honest, convener, and we could, we'll look into that and get back to you on that. Thank you, that's helpful. Any final questions from members? Mm -hmm. No, can I thank you very much for your attendance this morning. Um, don't rush away, the committee will go into private session, um, but we'd like you to stay behind. Thank you very much. <laughs>